So one of the common complications of IV lines is infiltration and extravasation. So these two terms, though often used interchangeably, have different meanings. In this video, we are going to talk about what each of them means. The cause, risk factors, signs and symptoms, management, and prevention. Hello lovely people, my name is Maya and I'm a registered nurse. Firstly, let's get the difference between infiltration and extravasation. So, extravasation is the unintended administration of a vesicant drug or solution into surrounding tissue. So, when you talk about a vesicant solution, it's one that is capable of causing blisters, tissue sloughing, and necrosis. So, common ones include chemotherapeutic agents, contrast agents, certain antibiotics, certain vasopressors, 10% dextrose, parental nutrition formulas, etc. On the other hand, infiltration is the unintended administration of a non vesicant drug or solution into surrounding tissue. I don't know where you are watching this video from, but in my part of the world, when infiltration occurs, we say the line has tissued. This is to literally let you know that the IV catheter has moved out of the blood vessel lumen into the tissues. But this is not an internationally recognized term. So let's just stick with infiltration and extravasation. So what causes it? So it results from a punctured vein or leakage around the vein. So what happens is that the IV catheter slips out or through the lumen of the blood vessel, as we see in this image. Risk factors include IV line at areas of flexion, such as the wrist, anticubital fossa, the foot and arm. Also malposition of catheter due to lack of securement. So it's advisable to have your adhesive tape ready before setting an IV line and ensure that you secure it firmly. Also difficult peripheral vascular access. So with this, the catheter might probably not be in a vein or you might have punctured one in the many attempts. So with many attempts or multiple attempts, usually around the same site, there's a greater risk of puncturing the venous lumen. Also peripheral IV catheter dwell time longer than 24 hours. Another risk factor is the inability to visualize the IV catheter insertion site, mostly due to the use of an adhesive tape that is not transparent. Also, subsequent insertion of a peripheral catheter after a first filled one. So as I already said, you may have punctured a vein. So though you might get access with the backflow of blood and all that, it's a line that will easily get infiltrated. Another risk factor is insertion of a short catheter length into a deep vein. Okay, so with this, the likely outcome is that the catheter may never reach the vein due to its length. Another one is prolonged injection time for vesicant medications and then patients inability to report pain and other discomforts. Medications that change pain sensation or suppress inflammatory response is a risk factor and also infection. Lastly, age-related or conditions that causes change to the vasculature, the skin, and the subcutaneous tissue. So let's look at signs and symptoms. So basically, all the signs and symptoms of inflammation is present. So there is pain at the site. And pain is usually the first symptom that most patients will report. It has the character of burning, stinging, or tightness at the insertion site, the catheter tip, or the entire venous pathway. This pain is of a sudden onset and is severe when it's associated with rapid injection of the solution. There is also edema, that is, there will be swelling of the site, and then there is color changes. So we have blanching for non vesicant and redness for vesicant. However, extravasation into deep tissue may not produce this redness that we are talking about. And then also in dark skinned people, this redness will not be like that obvious. 
so at the sides there may also be fluid leakage and then decreased or stopped flow rate so if it's an infusion the infusion will no longer flow and then blister formation but blister formation occurs with only a shavasation and it's evidence within like an hour to two weeks depending on the extravasated agent so let's go into the grading of infiltration and extravasation so this is an infiltration skill from the infusion nurses society ins showing the severity of infiltration on a scale of zero to four so you can pause the video and have a detailed look at it so what is a possible outcome of extravasation? So when extravasation occurs, it leads to severe damage at that site. And this will cause pain and then it can lead to infection. When there is infection, the site will become ulcerated. It can go on to become necrosed and then there will be prolonged healing. And then prolonged healing will lead to permanent damage or loss of function of that part. Management of infiltration and extravasation. So basically, it's the same management for both infiltration and extravasation, with a few exceptions which I'll mention later. So as soon as you observe infiltration, stop the administration of the solution or the medication and disconnect the tube inserts from the catheter. And then go ahead and perform a vigorous scrub of the catheter pot with methylated spirits. You can also use chlorhexidine solution and then you are allowed to dry completely. Then attach a 5 ml syringe and aspirate gently for blood retain. Do not flush. I repeat, do not flush. So the IV catheter is no longer in the vein. It's in the extravasated space, that is the tissues. And flashing the line will worsen it because you'll be introducing fluid into the tissue when the needed intervention is to get it out. Also, if it's a vesicant solution, flashing will transport it further into the tissues and we don't want to do that. Another key thing to note is that if the infiltrated agent is a contrast, you should not aspirate, okay? So there is no consistent evidence that the effect of it can be mitigated effectively by trying to aspirate. So do not aspirate if it's a contrast agent. After aspirating, remove the IV catheter and apply a dressing over it. And then you elevate the affected limb on pillows. So this will help to reduce swelling by causing lymphatic absorption. And then assess the neurovascular status of the limb. So you check for capillary refill, sensation in the limb, etc. And then you notify the doctor if there are any alterations. So you have to mark the affected area with a skin marker to serve as a baseline for later comparison. So this will help you to assess changes, that is whether the swelling is resolving or it's worsening. And then you estimate the volume of fluid that has gone into the tissues. So this can be done by noting the remaining volume in the bag when you stop the infusion and also the rate of infusion. Lastly, complete the extravasation documentation sheet. So some hospitals have a template document sheet for extravasated contrasts, chemotherapeutic agents, etc. It has details such as the name of the patient, the date and time, the IV catheter site, the IV catheter gauge, the signs and symptoms and interventions put in place, etc. So I have here a template by the SARI west success and hemshire cancer network you can pause the video and have a look at it so these details come on one sheet but i had to adjust it so you can see it clearly management of extravasation as i mentioned earlier is the same as for infiltration with a few exceptions so you never apply pressure to an extravasated area also, depending on the agents, an antidote may be administered subcutaneously using a gauge 25, intravenously, or topically. 
There can also be manual extraction, such as surgical fenestration and irrigation, liposuction, and percutaneous needle aspiration. So surgical fenestration and irrigation has been found to reduce the amount of extravasated agents with very good outcomes. Also, topical application of hydrocortisone and silver sulfadizan may be prescribed. So the hydrocortisone will help reduce the inflammation and then the silver sulfadizan will help to prevent infection. So let's look at prevention. So the next admission any infusion at any time is primarily responsible for the prevention, early detection and management of infiltration. So before you administer any medication, make sure that you check the patency of the IV catheter that you are going to use. So a flash should go freely without any resistance. Always select the infusion sites based on the patient and their drug characteristics. So you use larger veins or essential veins for solutions that are vesicant. It means that if you are going to administer a vesicant medication, you should do so with a central line. Also, you have to assess the patient's IV insertion sites continually during drug administration. So this will help with early detection and especially in patients that are unconscious or unable to report pain, this is very helpful. It's also advisable to use clear tape that will allow for inspection of the infusion site. So a clear tape will allow you to see what is happening beneath the tape. You can also immobilize the extremity with the IV cannula since excessive movement of that limb can cause the catheter to pierce the vein. Also, you can involve your patient in the early detection and prevention of infiltration or extravasation by educating them on the signs and symptoms and also the need to report any pain or burning immediately. So I mentioned earlier that pain is usually one of the first symptoms that most patients report. And if your patient is conscious and has sensation, then they should be able to report it promptly. One key thing that you should always do as a nurse is that after administering vesicant medications, always flush the vein with IV fluids. So this will help to keep the line less irritated and also patent. Lastly, don't rely on IV pump alarms to determine infiltration or extravasation. So although many IV pumps have a downstream occlusion alarm, these alarms aren't intended to dictate IV flow disruption. So what happens is that they'll continue to dispense the solution despite infiltration or extravasation. So there have been a lot of instances where patient's line was infiltrated and the alarm never sounded. It was only detected when the size was checked by a nurse. So don't rely on these pumps at all. So that's all for today. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share, and then subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so yet. See you in my next video. Bye.